Hi there, I'm Dr. Danny McVitie, uh, founder of the Lap of Love Veterinary Hospice. Um, I am, uh, I'm here today to answer one of the, the most important questions that we ever answer as veterinarians, and particularly when it comes to end of life um, care medicine, which is how do I know when it's time to say goodbye to, to my pet? Um, this is literally the question that has started an, uh, an entire movement that's turned into Lapo Love Veterinary Hospice and then even beyond as well. You know, as veterinarians, we, if, if you didn't know, we, we actually weren't really taught much in, um, in veterinary school about end-of-life care. So now it's something that my my, uh, my business partner and I also, you know, we go and teach to different schools about this, but it's something that is obviously very, very close to our heart and something that we do every single day as hospice and end-of-life care veterinarians. So it's a, it's a question that I wanted to address um, really on, on a Facebook Live with everybody, just in a very, very, um, a very relaxed atmosphere, just to, to kind of bring this conversation into your home. And hopefully you can share this with friends or family that may be going through this really difficult decision. Um, I'll start with a story um, about one night when I was on an emergency um, and uh, when I was a, a new graduate. So I was probably about two months out of school at this point. And um, true story, these, these, both these things happen. Um, so this, this one golden retriever came in and he was non-responsive. So he was what we call ladder recumbent non-responsive, just laying, laying down and couldn't breathe. Um, his gums were blue. And of course that tells us that we have some type of breathing issues. And then the family told us that he had recently been diagnosed with a condition called laryngeal paralysis, which means that he can't open his throat properly and breathe. And in this family, of course, this pet was a little bit elderly, so you know we talked them through what the options were, were going to be, but there, there really wasn't too many because he wasn't a good candidate for surgery. And then once we've gotten this far, then of course, you know, euthanasia tends to be one of the better options that we have at that time. Um, <clears throat> so that was that, that was one example one night, and probably about one hour later, another um, golden retriever, you know, a little older older guy, kind of wobbled in. And he was he had been well fed in his life and very arthritic, um, probably about 14 or 15 years old. But he had waddled in, you know, wagging his tail and tongue hanging out, and he was laughing. And you know, you could tell that he's still enjoying life, but very, very arthritic and having a really hard time getting up and moving around. And his family had brought him into the emergency clinic for euthanasia just because they they didn't want to go back to their regular veterinarian. It was just going to be um, a very difficult place for them to walk into if they had him euthanized there. So. Again, one more example of a really good and an appropriate decision for that pet on that day. But if you look at these two cases, you know, both of them have the, the decision to euthanize were, was made for very different reasons and under very different situations. So it's a great example for, for everybody and, and any pet owner, me included, to, to really weigh your options carefully depending on the disease process that we have, depending on the family's wishes and, and concerns, and then of course what the pet's experience of all this is going to be in, in, um, in the end as well. So that's the one main thing, you know, that, that I want to share with you guys is there's not one moment in time when it's a perfect decision to euthanize. And if you make the decision one minute later, it would have been worse. And if you made the decision one minute earlier, it would have been the wrong time. You know, there's really a period of time in which euthanasia is a good decision. It may not be your only decision, but it's a good decision. You know, there were many times in the emergency room when I first started that I had to have conversations that sounded like this in, in the ER, where a pet would come in and we have um, some type of, you know, very, very uh, condition that's declining rapidly. And I would have to say, look, we either need to, to euthanize or we need to go to surgery, but making no decision is the only wrong decision that we have right now. And that a lot of times applies to us when we talk about um, uh, end of life care is that making no decision is sometimes the only wrong decision that we have. So perhaps it might be something as simple as adding pain medicine, adding a little bit more therapy, um, adding even, even bringing the pet home from the hospital. That can be a, a good end of life decision. You know, um, or it's gonna be maybe talking to the family about euthanizing sooner rather than later, but I'm gonna get into that in a second. So, um, so that's the main thing again, is that there's not one moment in time when it's perfect but there's a period of time when it's a good decision. And some families want to make that decision really, really soon, and some families want to make that decision much later. Another um, family that, that we worked with in, in hospice care, um, they, uh, they had a, a mixed breed dog and she had um, osteosarcoma, so that's, that's bone cancer. So this pet had bone cancer, and that is what we call an imminent condition, which I'm gonna explain in a second. But that can just, condition can do, go downhill pretty rapidly. But this family did everything perfect. I mean, they read the textbook, their dog read the textbook, it was perfect. And we hospiced their, their dog for about six months. 
And, and I knew, and I told them, I said, the day that, that he, you know, because he, she, uh, she would always walk down the mailbox. So the day that, that she can't walk down to the mailbox is the day that we're going to talk about this next decision of euthanasia, because that's when, you know, obviously her quality of life was getting a little bit worse. So again, they, this family did everything perfect, pain management, everything. I had an oncologist looking over. It was fantastic. We got six months, which is what the oncologist said we would get. Six months if we do everything the way that, that, that we needed to do it. And I am not kidding, within a year later, the family called me again and they said that their next dog had been diagnosed with osteosarcoma, a bone cancer. And they called me um, on their way home from the veterinary clinic. They had just received this diagnosis from the veterinarian and they called me on the way home from the veterinary clinic and they said, doc, we just, we can't go through that again. Can you please come and meet us today so that we can say goodbye today because we just don't wanna go through that that entire decision making process in, in another six months. So I think that that's a really good example to everybody that, you know, even even you can have the same family but at different parts in your life, you may be choosing one thing or another and that gets down to the, the family's budgets and the family's concerns that they're going through, which I'm gonna also talk about in a little bit. But that just goes to show you one, one more time that you know, sometimes we can wait and wait and wait trying to eke out every last moment that we, we can with our pets or sometimes for many different reasons, even if it's the same disease condition, families might want to make that decision a little bit sooner rather than later. So there isn't one one uh, moment in time again that that's perfect by any means. But what we will do is we take the different the different boundaries that that everybody has and try to match them up. The disease is going to have a boundary. So the way we treat congestive heart failure or osteosarcoma, bone cancer, is very very different than the way we treat arthritis, something that's going to last a little bit longer. Um, every pet is going to have their their boundaries as well. So some pets are very, let's just say it, they're drama queens, right? You know, some some pets are very vocal with their wants and wishes in this world, and some pets are a little bit more stoic and have a high degree and a high level of pain tolerance. And it's it's just the truth that the fact that Great Danes and larger dogs are going to have a different type of pain tolerance than some of these smaller dogs that might be a little bit more sensitive sometimes. But every uh, family is going to have um, a, a different budget as well. So every family is going to have their own boundaries that we get to respect and honor as um, as veterinarians, you know, and certainly in, in as supporting friends and family as well. So we're going to go through each of these things together. Um, the disease process, what the pet may be going through, and then of course what the family is going through as well. And we put all those pictures together and we kind of package them up into a nice little neat you know, design of, 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 a, of an experience, of a path that's going to be best for everybody keeping the, the pet and the family at the center of that. So that's our role as end of life care veterinarians and coaching people through quality of life decisions and, and when to euthanize. And that's how we answer this all important question of, of really doc when, how will I know when it's time? So first one is the disease. Um, <clears throat> as I said, imminent conditions, and imminent conditions are ones that will go downhill very, very rapidly. These, these conditions are congestive heart failure, osteosarcoma, um, many seizuring conditions, brain cancer, something like that. Anything that's really gonna affect um, the cardiovascular system or the brain. So those most important components of keeping the body uh, alive. Um, heart, lungs, um, lung cancer is another one. Um, any other type of, of cancer that may affect the, the heart at all or, or the brain, again. Or um, osteosarcoma, which is the, the bone cancer, like I mentioned. Um, those are all things that can go downhill ra rapidly. So let's say I had a family that was, um, maybe they had a little Yorkie that has congestive heart failure. And they are saying that they want to eke out every last moment that they can. They want this to, to last very, very, you know, as, as long as they possibly can. Being an emergency clinician, I know that that will go downhill very rapidly. And waiting till the last moment with congestive heart failure will tend to mean that you're gonna be in the emergency room at two o'clock in the morning and you don't wanna be there. That's why I started this company in the, in the first place is so that you don't have to have that experience at the ER. Now, some people are willing to have that experience and they're willing to have every little last moment and that's okay, that's fine. But when we have imminent conditions, that, that is gonna be really difficult to, to wait until that last moment because what will mainly happen is that we will risk a sustained level of suffering. So example for congestive heart failure, when the, the heart stops working, which is what heart failure means, lung uh, congestion in the lungs, congestive heart failure, congestion fills up because the heart's, uh, the heart's entire role is meant to push blood through the lungs and into the rest of the body. It goes So from the right side of the heart through the lungs into the left side of the heart and then into the body. So when the heart isn't working to do that, pushing it through the lungs, the fluid will back up into the lungs 
And if you ask any asthmatic or anybody that has ever had any type of dip, uh, breathing problems, they will tell you it's one of the scariest things that they can go through. So families with congestive heart failure, I really try to coach them into making that decision a little bit sooner rather than later. Um, so that's just one example. Um, another example is, is again, um, uh, the uh, uh, any type of brain tumor or brain um, condition where maybe we have sustained seizures. Now, seizures aren't typically painful for the actual pet going through it, and, and other humans have, have concurred with this as well that have had seizures, um, but it's very painful for the family. It can be very, very difficult for them to watch, and those things can happen at any time. Just as we know, you know, seizures can kind of be like our computer just stopping and shorting out a little bit, and that's what happens in the brain when, when we have a seizure, and of course, we never know when that's, when that's gonna happen. So that's something to, to keep in mind as well. So um, those are the imminent conditions. And then let's go to the other extreme, non-imminent conditions. These are the conditions that are, are um, disease-wise, physiologically, are gonna last quite a long time. So an example is arthritis. Arthritis, pets can live with arthritis for years. Um, something called degenerative myelopathy, which uh, golden retrievers, I'm sorry, um, uh, German shepherds get a lot. Um, and that can last a long time. That's almost kind of like Lou Gehrig's disease in, in, in dogs, kind of. Um, chronic renal failure. Cats can live with chronic renal failure for a very long time. And there are other types of cancers that pets can live a long time with as well that may not be immediately life-threatening. Um, but those conditions are, are, you know, I always tell families that are going through those, you have the blessing and the curse of time. You know, you have the, the ability to actually be there and be present with your pet, but every day you're gonna be thinking, gosh, is it today, gosh, is it today, gosh, is it today. So sometimes, you know, that, 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 can, that can be stretched for a long time and, and sometimes it can't. But renal failure, honestly, is one of the better examples that we have of this because, again, cats can live with it for a long time, dogs too. And it's a matter of, of, of addressing the very specific quality of life that that pet is going through. Subcutaneous fluids that you can do at home are a fantastic, fantastic way to keep that pet feeling comfortable. We can add in very easy pain medicine that can just be given under the tongue. There are a lot of ideas that um, obviously your veterinarian will want to walk through you specifically, um, walk through with you specifically, that can give you um, again, you know, all, all different kinds to think about. So these these non-imminent conditions, the ones that can last a long time, we have a, a quite a, a lot of, of levity, a lot of hospice time, if you will, to walk families th uh, through those conditions. There's another con um, category called the not, uh, intermediate. So not imminent and not um, non-imminent, but then intermediate. These are um, a little bit more of the conditions that can kind of go either way. Um, nasal adenocarcinoma, so some of the nasal cancers that we get. Um, there's some of the other skin cancers. So there's a, a lot of conditions that will fit in that intermediate one, but definitely talk to your veterinarian about whether or not we have one of those that's gonna turn um, imminent uh, at, at any point. So that's very important for, for you guys to, to know with your own pets. So besides the, the disease process, so now we've talked about the disease process, the boundaries that we have there that we don't really have too much control over, um, but there's also the, the pet's boundaries. So every pet is gonna have their own decisions. Um, one of my, my mentors and some veterinarian that I follow all the time, Dr. Robin Downing, um, she says that a pet will participate in his or her treatment. And I love that. I just think it's fantastic because they do. They tell us when they want this treatment or when they don't. And when I have a family with, a, with let's say, a chronic renal failure cat, and we know that these sub fluids are gonna really do a lot physiologically for this, this cat, but if their cat is running away from them every single time they go to do subcutaneous fluids, that is a really, really big deal. That, that cat, you're gonna risk breaking that human-animal bond that you have with that pet if every time you walk up to your cat, they're running away from you, or you're trying to shove a pill down their throat. You know, that goes again for cats or dogs, but it's a really important part of, of the puzzle that I think as families, you really need to have permission to allow your pet to participate in his or her treatment and let that be okay. You know, let that be an okay thing that you accept, just like if it was another one of your family members and your family member, a human family member is saying, you know, no, I don't want that treatment. That's that pet saying that and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with it. So your veterinarian will walk you through what we can step away from and you know and, and, and what we can't step away from um, there's all kinds of quality of life skills out there you guys there are so many and and I I, um, I joke all the time you know I think we should write an article about the quality of life scales that we um, that we suggest for families because there are some families that are highly analytical and need an algorithm with okay what's the exact number that we're gonna get you know with this quality of life scale 
And some families need something as simple as a penny in a jar. You put a penny in a jar for good days and a penny in a jar for bad days. I kind of wish I had that quality of life skill when I was dating as well. You know, I figured that might be a good one. You know, good days and bad days just to weigh everything out. Um, you know, but sometimes people just want a calendar and you want to put a red X on a really bad day, a half a red X on, on, a, a, on an okay day, and maybe a green check on a good day and blank for, you know, maybe something that's not really in, in, in between. But that can give you a holistic approach of what that pet's overall health looks like. There's also some really great resources that, that A, we have on, on our website, so lapoflove.com. If you go to quality of life tab, you will find a couple of scales that Dr. Mary and I designed on our own. Um, we have one that's very much tailored to the pet's reaction and then one that's tailored to the family's reaction, which as you can tell by the time I'm done talking here, you know, is a really big part of that entire puzzle. It's not just the pet, but it's also the disease, the pet, and then what the family is seeing and experiencing and their boundaries as well. Um, so lapalove.com, we have some scales. The other two that are very, very well respected within the veterinary profession, I want to share them both with you. Um, first is the ASPCAs, and ASPCA has this on their website, but they call it the five freedoms. And the five freedoms they identify are the freedom from hunger and thirst, the freedom from discomfort, um, the freedom from injury or pain, and the freedom to express normal behavior. Now, also the freedom to uh, the f uh, freedom from fear and distress, uh, distress as well. So I want to go back to the freedom for um, for uh, freedom to express normal behavior because it's not as normal for a 14 year old dog to run around and play catch as it is for a two year old. So just because your 14 year old can't run around and play catch or fetch, that doesn't necessarily mean that he's not expressing normal behavior. That just means that it's not normal for his age anymore. So I think we can get wrapped up in, this, in that sometimes. Well, he can't play fetch anymore and he loves playing fetch. Yes, that's absolutely an important part of the entire equation. But just remember to, to adjust that. Maybe you can sit in front of him and toss the ball to him and let him just lay there and you know grab the ball in his, in his mouth and then toss it right back. So there's many different ways that we can adjust the, um, the expression of normal behavior. But again, it's hunger and thirst, dis, uh, discomfort, injury or pain, no, uh, the uh, freedom to express normal behavior, and then the freedom from fear or distress. So there's, there's different ways to look at that, but that's a, another just a thing to think about. Um, the last one that I want to share with you is called the H5M2 scale, and that's on POSPIS. We're going to put this in, in the links down below, but P-A-W-S-P-I-C-E by one of my other mentors, Dr. Alice Villalobos, who's just a fantastic um, veterinary. Um, she works mainly in the oncology field. And she formed this quality of life scale that has um, been one of the only ones that we've been um, at least uh, op uh, uh, been introduced to over the years in veterinary medicine. And it's um, H H it's H five M two so H H H H H M two M M um, happiness hydration hunger uh, mobility um, and there's there's um, there's another one that the the M is but it's a fantastic little link that we will um, give to you guys as well. So we're going to have all of those. Um, in, in the links just so that you at least can understand them and what quality of life scales actually exist out there for the pets, which is, which is important. Again, everybody's going to have their own way and their, you know, their, their own method of measuring that quality of life scale. So whatever way works for you is the way that, that you should use. Absolutely. So the last thing is the family. So we've talked about the disease boundaries, the pets boundaries, and then we're going to talk about the family's boundaries. There are four budgets that a family needs to weigh, and we all know this subconsciously, but I'm going to give a name to them. The first one is money, so everybody obviously understands that. You know, in veterinary medicine, I think that that, was, that, that is not just for me, but for most veterinarians that join the field. It's one of the more important things that, um, that, we, that we realize when we get out of um, veterinary school is that we really do need to work within the financial boundaries that families have. And there are some families that have unlimited boundaries, and that's wonderful. But even those with unlimited, sometimes I can't save their pet anyway. Um, but there's also families that have um, obviously a very, very limited budget. And that is okay. It simply is the way that life works, you guys. And just because you may be able to get six more months with your pet if you were able to afford to go do all this you know, monstrous oncology work and you can't afford that, that is okay. That's okay. I'm telling you, some of the, the hardest conversations I had as an emergency room doctor were for the people that wish they had the money and they didn't. And yet I would tell them, even if you did have all the money in the world, I still couldn't get you another five or 10 years with your pet. It's only gonna be a few more months. And, and again, I think we need to really honor that and, and accept the fact that out in the wild, things are much more different. You know, families tell, tell me all the time, well, I just wish he could go 
pass naturally, but you know, nature has a very different way of making these decisions than, than we do. And nature doesn't have to deal with money. So please don't don't make don't feel guilty by the fact that maybe you don't have all the money in the world to, to, to treat your pet. If you're listening to this in the first place, you care about your pet and you love your pet and you've done the very, very best that you can possibly do. And from here on out, you need to just weigh whether or not spending $3,000 to get a couple more weeks is going to be the best thing for you and your family overall or not. I would rather see a pet be at home, comfortable with really good, adequate pain management, and then just live a nice, comfortable, you know, couple of days instead of just potentially living a few more weeks in a hospital. You know, and we see that all the time in veterinary medicine. So, of course, money is an important budget. Um, there's also emotions. So emotions are a huge, huge budget. I am going to tell you a couple of stories that are hopefully not going to bring too many tears to, to your to your eyes. But um, I've, I've euthanized pets that belong to um, adult children that committed suicide. And now the parents are left with this pet. Maybe it's an aggressive pet that nobody else can touch. Um, maybe the, 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 the person that committed suicide, their last wish was to just simply have their pet buried with them at some point. And if we're talking about an elderly pet that has absolutely no ability to get adopted again, you know, that's a decision that we may make a little bit sooner than, than we want. But there have been so many difficult decisions that I've helped families make, even something, even something like the, the, the spouse is, is um, dying of cancer. Or even just a couple weeks ago in Tampa, we had another client who she was actually dying of cancer. And so we euthanized her pets. They were all elderly. Um, but one of them was a puppy. And so we actually decided to adopt the puppy in, into our family. Um, and so someone that works with us actually took the, the little puppy. So there's so many different things in, that, that go under the emotional umbrella um, that we don't always know. And it's so easy for us to stand on the outside and, and judge somebody else's opinion or um, decision making. But we don't know what's going on, on in the inside. And I've been privy to so many things and so many, so many very, very difficult times that families are having within their own lives that makes a decision to euthanize a pet difficult. Um, but but certainly necessary for many reasons. So there's money budget, like I said, emotional budget. There's also a time budget. There, I've helped pets that belong to families with a single mom, and she's making ends meet. So maybe money or emotions aren't really the the, the big thing, but she's having a, a trouble giving the the old elderly cat their insulin injection shots. Having a really really big trouble, you know, actually getting the the elderly dog or cat to the hospital so that they can have their weekly or monthly checkups just to keep them going. You know, that's a really big, big deal for a lot of people is having the time to actually treat their pet and then walk them through the, the you know, the, the nursing process. So the actual time to, to keep them through the, that, again, that end of life hospice process. And that's an okay thing as well. If you don't have the time to do that, there are some things that we can help with in medicine and there's some things we can't help with. But talk to your veterinarian because we can certainly work within that boundary, um, of course, and, and, and honoring that within the family. So the last budget is physical budget. This is kind of goes back to the cat that's running away from the subcutaneous fluids. And subcutaneous just means under skin. And so that's just when we, when we put a needle under the skin and then we give fluids. And that's something that families can do at home. And it's a really, really nice therapy for the pets that are accepting of it. But what if your cat's running away from you every time? What if your dog's running away from you? What if you have 18 pills that you're supposed to give your dog and they're starting to not eat because it tastes like pills every time? Or they don't, they don't even want to go near you because every time they do, you're trying to shove something down their throat. That's a really big physical boundary that, that, that we have to honor for sure. You know, and that may not be money or time or emotions or physicality or anything, but it's just simply, or the, the, it's just simply the physical boundary people have in actually getting the therapy and the nursing care into, in, into that pet. Maybe we have a 130 pound Mastiff and hospicing that Mastiff through arthritis is very different than hospicing a little Chihuahua through arthritis. I have literally hospiced a Chihuahua over six months, this pet didn't even walk. It was a tiny little chihuahua, wanted to sit in, in dad's little you know, pet carrier on, on his chest every day, happy as can be. This dog was in no pain, got, got fed you know, uh, human food from the table every day, no problem at all. This little dog was completely fine. Hadn't walked in six months because his, his wrists were completely dislocated from very advanced arthritis. Again, the pet was completely happy. Totally happy. And that is a different physical boundary than when we have a hundred plus dog, really even 50 or 60 plus you know, pound dog that we have to get up and move around and take outside, clean up the urine, clean up the feces. You know, Again, that's very, very different. So those nursing boundaries can become very, very difficult sometimes. So I wanna give you guys a brief overview. 
when we're talking about how to make that decision, there are different types of boundaries that we have to look at. We have to look at the disease boundaries, the pets boundaries, and the family boundaries. Within the disease um, boundaries, there's imminent, non-imminent, and intermediate. So different classifications mean that we can make that decision sooner or later, or we can wait, or we can not wait. We really need to push that decision a little bit sooner to prevent going to the emergency room. So there's the disease um, uh, boundaries. And then we have the pets boundaries. There's a lot of quality of life skills that I want you guys to look up. The five freedoms that the ASPCA has come up with. H5M2 that Dr. Alice Villalobos came up with on pospis.com. And then the quality of life skills that we have on our website as well, um, lapoflove.com. Or if you just need something really simple, put a penny in a jar for good day, penny in a jar for a bad day. And then lastly, the family's boundaries. And those are the four budgets. Um, the money budget, um, you might have the emotional budget, the time budget, and then the physical budget as well. So there are those, those four boundaries. And lastly, you know, I want to encourage you guys um, to, to share with your friends and family, you know, two other phrases that, that, that I, I like to use. The first one is it's better to help a friend a day too early than a second too late. And this is, again, something that I saw every single day in the emergency room. Families just saying, they, by the time they get there, they just say, I wish I would have made this decision sooner. I wish I would have made this decision sooner. And I have to tell you, I have never had somebody say, I made this decision too soon. I wish I would have waited. Everybody says, I should have made this sooner. Because when you see your pet comfortable and calm after they've passed, with the, even the word euthanasia means good death. Youth, and youth, which means good or true. Thanasia means related to death. When you provide a good passing, families just have this relief that comes over them. They stand up, they do this thing with their with, with their body language. You know, they get they just they open up their body and they just they they say, Oh my gosh, I'm just I'm so relieved. I can't believe how relieved I am. It's because you don't have to worry about them anymore. So it's better to help a friend a, a, a day too early than a second too late. And the other phrasing that, that I want you guys to remember is that you know, particularly with with what we do, and hopefully, if you're if you're not in one of our our areas, then you know potentially there's uh, other veterinarians that do this in your area. And if not, just Google mobile veterinarian, then your zip code, and you'll find somebody that's willing to come to your home. But anything is possible these days. You know, we have amazing medical protocols. We have we have the avail availability of euthanasia solution, which is just an overdose of barbiturates. It's an overdose of anesthesia. We didn't even have that 50, 60 years ago. You know, this medication hasn't been a, a, around for that long. So we have the availability to do any of this with, with our pets. And literally, if you want your experience to, with your pet to be on, on the backyard at sunset, you know, with your family gathered around, with a ring of candles around, with everyone saying a prayer and sharing good stories, all of these things I've been a privilege to be a part of as a veterinarian, all of that is possible. It's all possible. We're just gonna have to plan it, and it might be a little sooner than you want it to be. But make sure you're working within the boundaries of, of, of the disease and of the pet and certainly of the family as well. And just remember that that stuff is possible if we plan it a little bit sooner maybe than you want, but as long as we're able to, to plan that, then, then any, any of it's possible. Any of those beautiful experiences are possible that, that we've, again, we've all been privileged to be with um, in veterinary medicine. So, you know, um, again, please feel free to share this with your friends and family, people that are going through this experience. And remember that when we're going through this experience, when it's our pet, and I'm a veterinarian, I get to say this, when it's our pet, we're not always emotionally sober enough to make this, these decisions on our own. And that's what I say to my families all the time that I work with, is that this isn't something that you have to decide on your own. I'm a veterinarian, I do this all the time. I need someone else to walk me through this when it's my decision. And about three months ago, I did lose my, my, my baby. She, one of her, her pictures right up there, actually. And then her, her urn is right over there. Um, you know, I, I lost mine, and I know what that's like. Trust me, every veterinarian knows what that's like. So get some help, have some real, real good, supportive people around you. There are some people that you're not gonna want around you at that time, because maybe they're not gonna support the way that you love and care for your pet. And that's fine also, that's totally fine. Just support yourself with people that are gonna think and react and love your pet the same way that you do, so you can have some really good, good, solid emotional advice to get through this. Because like I said, we're not always emotionally sober when we're making these decisions and when we're put in these situations to care for our loved ones. So. I hope that helps. Thank you so much to you amazing, amazing friends um, that have commented on here. You know, this is what keeps me going. All these thank you cards back here. I wish I could pay back my student loans with thank you cards, you know, because I might have worked even harder than I have been. 
Um, but all of us are like this. And, and I'll, I'll end with the one thing that everybody says to all of us. Um, and Zeta, Dr. Brad, I just saw him yesterday up in Philadelphia. And you guys are so wonderful. Um, but I'm going to end with, with, with this, which is what everybody asks us. How do you do this? This must be the worst part of your job. How do you guys get through this day? And I have to tell you that it is an honor. It's an immense honor to be with the families that we get to be with. And that's why we do this. That is why we do this. Because there's a fulfillment that we get from this type of practice that as, as veterinarians and just doctors in general, we don't always get from the typical day-to-day -day stuff. But when you get to help a friend through this type of experience, it's one of the most memorable things that as doctors we get to go through. So thank you guys for providing us, for letting us in your home, for opening us up to, to that experience. Um, but if you have any questions at all, please feel free to comment them. And then um, we'll be going through and actually answering these questions and I'll go through personally and answer them as well. Um, but thank you so much um, for listening and hope you guys have a fantastic weekend. Take care. Bye-bye.